Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Wilbur. I'm the uh, chief of the U.S. Geological Survey's National Water Quality Assessment Program, and it's indeed my pleasure uh, to welcome you to, to this briefing that will present findings from uh, the ECOLOG on the ecological health of the nation's streams. Um, this is actually the 31st briefing on uh, on Capitol Hill that the NACA program is given with uh, many of our co-sponsors, which I'll introduce in a, in a few moments. Um, in the way of some background, in, in 1986, the Congress asked the USGS to develop uh, a national water quality assessment program. It would really do three things. Provide nationally consistent descriptions on current conditions for the nation's current water quality conditions for the nation's streams and, and major aquifers. We would determine how those conditions are changing over the course of time. And perhaps most importantly, it would provide information on the major factors that affect water quality conditions and an understanding of why the conditions are changing uh, with time. Uh, one of the things that Congress uh, required or specified was that we direct uh, our information uh, the policymakers and resource man managers provide them with the information that will assist them in making sound, uh, sound decisions to protect the nation's water resources. So this 31st briefing um, is really important to us. It's one of the ways that we get our information out uh, to our stakeholders and particularly to many of you who are involved in, in resource management and, and policy decision making. Uh, we typically give one or two of these briefings. We've actually been doing these since the early 1990s. Previous briefings have focused on water quality conditions uh, and their impacts, um, and their impacts on water quality. A number of the contaminant groups that we focused on included pesticides, uh, nutrients, volatile organic uh, compounds. Uh, last fall, we had a, a briefing on the effect of urbanization on the nation's streams. Um, and then about a year or so ago, we had a, had a briefing uh, that basically released information on an online interactive decision uh, support tool that provided information and capability for water resource managers to, to link uh, information on, on uh, sources, both natural and man-made, uh, for nutrients and how they're transported downstream to, to large estuaries such as the Chesapeake Bay or the Great Lakes or, or even the Gulf of Mexico. Today's briefing is about the importance and influence of changes in stream flow, selected contaminants, and the health of aquatic life uh, in the nation's streams. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce or, or thank our, a lot of our uh, co-sponsors for this briefing. Um, we expect to see very shortly uh, Congresswoman uh, Donna Edwards uh, from Maryland. Uh, we want to of course, thank uh, Benjamin Cardin, Senator Cardin from Maryland, uh, Congressman uh, Jim Moran from, from Virginia, and then some of our co-sponsors that have been with us for quite a while, the Water Environment Federation, who's actually been co-sponsoring these briefings since, I think, 1999, and more recently, the Northeast Midwest Institute. We thank them all for their support, and again, for making these briefings possible. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Darren Carlisle. Well, actually, before I do that, let me give you, a, I guess, a few words on kind of the format and, and arrangement for today's briefing. Uh, we've got three speakers uh, this morning. Our main speaker is Dr. Darren Carlisle. Uh, Darren's going to give a summary of the major findings from the NACO Ecological Studies and provide the broad conclusions and implications we can draw from, from these findings. And following Darren, we're going to have speakers from Tennessee and California, uh, two states who have similar goals and needs, but very, very different uh, climatic and, and hydrologic settings. They'll tell, you about, we'll, they'll tell you about the science and understanding provided by NACA, that NACA contributes to their activities and responsibilities, and how, how they're building on this work to protect uh, water and, and life resource, aquatic life resources. Uh, and now, uh, I, I noticed We've got uh, Congresswoman Donna Edwards from, uh, from Maryland, who's very graciously taken her time this morning uh, to spend a few moments with us and say a few remarks. Uh, Congress Thank you. Congresswoman Edwards. Thank you. 
And I'll let you get right on with the panel. I just stepped up here and said I want a copy of the report. So I would love to stay for the findings, but I'm going to get, I want the report. Um, I'm Congresswoman Donna Edwards. I represent the 4th Congressional District of Maryland, which is just outside of the, uh, of the city here. And um, in Prince George's in Anne Arundel County. And my district actually stretches from uh, the Potomac River all the way to the border of the Chesapeake Bay. And so I get this part of our Chesapeake Bay watershed, and of course we care and think about water quality all the time. Also just happen to be from uh, Prince George's County where we've had our own little water experiences <laughs> over the last couple of days. Um, and that, I mean, and that's actually really important to the way that you um, think about what we're learning about water quality and whether we're developing the kinds of um, water infrastructure that actually protects our, um, our groundwater supplies. And so uh, thank you very much for what you do and for the information that you, uh, that you provide. Welcome to the Congress. I know Senator Cardin um, was so gracious to be able to make sure that you could meet here. And um, you, you know in Maryland, we have this like, great phrase called Team Maryland. And it's because all of us care about, um, particularly about water and water quality, because we care so much about our bay, which provides so much tremendous um, resource to our economy in this five-state uh, watershed, and what it has meant to make sure that we understand what's going on with our water quality and the things that we're doing in our metropolitan areas that impact um, our water systems like the, uh, like the Chesapeake Bay. But that is true across the country. I've had the privilege of being on our Transportation and Infrastructure uh, Committee. And one of our subcommittees, of course, is our Subcommittee on Water Resources, where we're looking at, um, at these questions of, of water quality and, 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 and to a larger extent, um, the way it is that as humans we have an impact on that on that quality. And I think about our metropolitan area in the Washington the Washington region. And I live right on the Potomac. And um, you know, and I as I'm walking along, sometimes when you know somebody frees up a moment, uh, walking along the edges, and I see the water bottles, and I see the you know you can see the film from the cars that are driving across the, our, our Wilson Bridge here. And I know that every time that that happens, it has a tremendous impact, not just on our groundwater systems here in the metropolitan region, but all through the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And it has a tremendous impact on the ecosystems of that watershed. And so in addition to being concerned about water quality, because all of us want to know that when we turn on a faucet, we put that glass up under there and we drink it, um, that it's not going to do bad stuff to us. Um, but we also know that um, a large part of our economy um, in the United States depends on us being able to, uh, to protect the, the quality of our water systems. And so thank you very much for your research. I'm actually really looking forward uh, to the report. I hope that, I hope, um, and I don't know that it's always true, but I think as a member of Congress, what we want is um, for agencies like the USGS and all of your, uh, your partners um, to do the kind of research that informs smart public policy. And, um, and so you can't do the public policy work or you can make recommendations to us, but we have to have the kind of data that's really important, the information that we need, the knowledge base over a period of time. Um, over decades so that we really understand what's going on in our larger environment so that we can make smart public policy choices. And that is true on our Water Resources uh, Committee. Are we going to make decisions about um, things that are important to me, like using green infrastructure techniques to protect our, our water supply? Are we going to make decisions about uh, investments in maintenance of that infrastructure uh, to protect our, our water supply? Are we going to make the kinds of investments in energy technologies um, that ultimately have a tremendous impact on uh, not just our quality, the quality of our water, but the quality of our life? And so thank you very much for what you do. And I'm not going to keep you longer because you have experts here who are way smarter than practically any member of Congress, and good for you. Um, but welcome to the, uh, to the Capitol. Enjoy your, uh, your morning and the briefing this morning. And I'm looking forward to seeing the results. Thank you.
Congressman, Ed, uh, with Congressman Edwards, thank you very much for your time and, and for your remarks. Um, again, uh, in, in the way of just some background to set the stage for, the, for this briefing, we've got uh, three panelists this morning. We're going to start out in a moment with our, our primary speaker, Darren Carlisle, and be followed by, by David McKinney and, and Dr. Peter Rohde. Um, format for the briefing, each of the, the speakers will uh, deliver some uh, short presentation. Uh, that will be followed by an opportunity for a, uh, one or two clarifying questions, if there are any. Uh, but then, toward the, at the end of the briefing, we'll provide uh, an open, open time for any, any questions or, or discussions. So, uh, the whole idea is if we can keep the, the presentation moving so those people that may have to leave early uh, can do so. so um, Again, uh, uh, just uh, want to introduce Darren Carlisle. Uh, Darren is the, the lead ecologist uh, for the U.S. Geological Survey's uh, NACWA program. Uh, for the last five years, uh, uh, Darren has directed the national synthesis of information uh, for NACWA on the hydrology, water and sediment chemistry, and, and, uh, and stream ecology. This culminated in the report that uh, is the basis for this briefing uh, this morning. Uh, Darren received his, his master's degree from, from Utah State in, in aquatic ecology and his PhD in ecotoxicology from, from Colorado State uh, University. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Darren Carlisle. Uh, thank you, Bill. <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to tell you a little bit about our work. Uh, we don't often realize it, but streams and rivers, in some way, are a part of all of our lives. Uh, they provide a bounty of natural and cultural resources, socioeconomic goods and services like drinking water, uh, recreational opportunities. Uh, for example, in the United States, the sport fishing industry is a $120 billion a year business, employing upwards of a million people. Now, streams and rivers also provide homes, of course, for countless uh, aquatic and terrestrial species that depend on those rivers. Now, these ecosystems provide these services only if they remain healthy and resilient. Unfortunately, the health of our nation's streams and rivers is increasingly at risk. In fact, a recent survey by the Environmental Protection Agency reported that more than half of the nation's streams and river miles or in some way have uh, impaired ecological health. Now what that means is that poor water quality is limiting uh, the, uh, the potential of these streams and rivers to provide the benefits to society that we can get from them. Now, um, what I'd like to, if, if we're gonna solve this problem, if we're gonna work on this problem, what we really need to understand is what are the factors that cause poor stream health and how are those factors related to the things we do, to our actions and activities? Um, so what I'd like to tell you a little bit about today is how we can better understand what factors cause poor health, um, really how to sort of diagnose what might be the problem, um, and also how those factors actually influence aquatic life. Um, so we do know that water quality and stream health is influenced by land and water management practices at the local scale, um, at the watershed scale, but even regional, national, and global scales. Uh, indeed, the change in land and water use in the United States over the last century has been dramatic. Uh, large areas have been urbanized or put into suburban lands as people moved into cities to seek opportunities. Currently, 80% of our uh, population in this country uh, is in, uh, resides in major metropolitan areas. So, uh, watch how these urban areas there in red and pink have expanded over, over the last hundred years. Now, the 20th century was an unprecedented era of water resource uh, management and development. Um, we captured the flows of our streams and rivers to provide flood control, uh, hydropower, water supplies, recreational opportunities for our population. Uh, this is a measure of reservoir storage and watersheds from 1900. 2000, and you can see how that's increased dramatically. Currently, there's uh, 
somewhere around 8,000 dams on our nation's waterways. And these dams are all, sh all shapes and sizes. And they impact hydrologically um, about 20, an estimated 20% of the nation's river miles. Now, this development in water resources and, 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 and distribution of water really helped uh, increase the productivity of our farms and our agricultural systems. Along with that, uh, we see a, a very large increase in the chemicals that we apply to our farms through time. In this case, this example is nitrogen fertilizer application. So, in the wake of these drastic changes in land and water just in the last century, it's tempting to ask, is it even possible to have healthy streams and rivers, but also use our land and our water for other needs, like agricultural production, or uh, development of suburban and urban places for our population? Well, NACWA findings um, suggest that we can. Using aquatic species as indicators of ecological health. Uh, we found that in primarily agricultural and urban watersheds, nearly one in five, or 17% of the streams that we assessed, have relatively good ecological health. Now, this finding is important because it does show that we can develop the land and the water resources, but also reap the benefits from healthy rivers and streams at the same time. Now, of course, there's the other part of that pie there. Um, in these same agricultural and urban settings, um, more than 80% of the streams that we assessed had at least some level of, of uh, decline uh, or impaired bioecological health. Sorry. So, you know, this implies that the human influence on stream health and water quality is pervasive in these in these agricultural and urban settings. Well, what is it about land use that uh, inf influences stream health in negative ways, and if we understand what those factors are, how do we use that to make local policy decisions and smart policy management decisions? Well, it turns out that making this connection between what we do on the land and what we see in the stream is, is complicated by the fact that many of these factors that cause poor stream health are highly changing, rapidly changing through time. They're, they're very hard to uh, sometimes to measure. Um, for example, the chemical concentrations you see in a stream today uh, may be very different if you sampled the same stream uh, six months from now. Um, to show you an example with real data, here's uh, two graphs of daily stream flow in the uh, Des Moines River in Iowa in two different years. This is the entire year of 2009 and 2012. And yes, they are drawn to the same scale. You can see there's very dramatic differences just in the stream flow through time and the hydrology of those different years. Well, on top of that, here's the concentration of atrazine, which is a pesticide applied for uh, weed control. You can see that the concentrations of atrazine vary dramatically through the year. They're typically higher in the, uh, in the summer months, which are these green, the green rectangles there. But the concentrations vary dramatically from one year to the next. Well, what this variability means is that some of the stressors, some of the factors that harm stream health, really can only be understood with intensive monitoring, intensive chemical monitoring, and physical monitoring. And it also shows that if we're going to if we're going to uh, deal with and understand the nation's water quality issues, we really need to use a variety of scientific tools and a variety of monitoring approaches and designs. Uh, sort of the one-size-fits-all approach is not going to be, not going to be adequate. So uh, in, for our assessment, uh, NACWA select, uh, chose uh, what we might say is a, a, a multifaceted design where we selected sites to sample based on uh, knowing that they had some influence from specific land uses. So that's a targeted design. And we, we focused on agricultural and urban areas because uh, most of the nation's streams and rivers have at least some agricultural and, or urban land use in their watersheds. And so these land uses are pervasive across the country. We collected data in over 2,000 streams and rivers across the country in 50 different river basins. At many of these streams, we sampled 
very intensively for many chemical measurements. This is just a small flavor over here on, on the left. And in many of these streams, we also monitored continuously things like stream flow. So the stream flow was actually measured every 15 minutes in many of these systems. So how then do we measure stream health? Well, uh, an important part of a health, uh, healthy ecosystem is really its ability to support life, uh, in particular native species. Well, biological communities are groups of organisms that can be easily collected and identified and they give us a clue, an important clue, about uh, the ability of that ecosystem to support life. Well, in streams, the dominant uh, biological communities are algae, macroinvertebrates, which is just a big name for bugs and snails and worms, and then fish communities. So what we do is we go to these streams and we make collections of these organisms. And we look at the species that we find there, and if the kinds of species that we see there are substantially less than that stream's natural potential, we conclude that there's been some human alteration of that community, and we often say it's in poor condition. Well, how do we know what is this natural potential? Well, the natural potential is really the kinds of species we would expect to find in a stream under minimal human influences. Well, how do we know what that is? Well, what we do with how we get that information is by monitoring streams and rivers in watersheds with the, with the least amount of human influence in all different regions of the country. So that gives us a basis for making these, these, these statements. Now, that requires a lot of collaboration with our partners over at EPA Office of Water, um, other federal and many state agencies who also spend resources in, in monitoring these, these less disturbed watersheds. So to sum up, then the presence of an altered biological community indicates that the stream has um, received some um, insult from human activities and therefore the stream health has declined. Well, there's a lot of different factors that contribute to reduced stream health across the country. Uh, I showed you a list of things we measured just a moment ago. Those are all potential factors and there's many more. In the interest of time this morning, what I'd like to do is just focus on three that are widely important and I think have a high relevance to a lot of people. And those three factors are modified flows or the modification of natural stream flows, excessive nutrients, and pesticides. So let's talk about flow. Uh, of course, flowing water is the very essence of a stream. Um, so the natural patterns in flow really are crucial to maintaining the health of a stream. Well, in nearly 90% of the streams where we assessed flow, um, we found some human-caused modification to these natural patterns of flow. Now there's many ways to measure or, or to, to characterize what the natural flow of a stream is. You can think about uh, measuring um, the magnitude of flow or the seasonality of the flow or the duration of different flows, but they're all really impacted by or modified by humans in a couple of basic ways, and I'll show you one example. Um, so every stream has a period every year where the flows are at their lowest. We call, that, we call that the base flow period. And these flows will fluctuate from year to year because there's differences in precipitation from year to year. Well, many aquatic species rely on this period of low flow to complete their life cycles. For example, this is a period when many small fish are just hatching out of their eggs and beginning their lives. Now, we can, we can make flows um, higher than natural by doing things like releasing water from a reservoir down the river in a normally dry period, or by discharging into a river um, effluent from, from a treatment facility, to just name a couple of examples. Well, we can also create lower than natural face flows by doing things like excessive pumping of groundwater or diverting water from the stream. Well, we found different patterns of flow modification across the country. And to continue this example with base flow, I'll show you what that looked like. 44% of the streams that we assessed had higher than natural base flows. And uh, these were especially common in the Midwest and in the Eastern United States, where we have a lot of streams 
that are influenced by flood control structures and intensive agriculture and urbanization. On the other hand, about a third of the streams that we assessed had lower than natural base flows. And these occurred throughout the country, but were especially prominent out west, where we have a lot of uh, groundwater pumping and a lot of diversions for a variety of purposes. Now, in addition to base flow, which I just showed you, um, we found that high flows in streams were less than natural at about half the streams that we assessed. And the variability of stream flow was less than natural at about 40% of the streams we assessed. And what we mean by this is basically we've taken the natural ebbs and flows and pretty much made the flows <laughs> constant. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of phenomenon we often observe here. Well, what, is this, what does this matter to the biological communities? Well, I'd like to show you how that actually looks. Um, in a stream that has relatively natural flows that's, that's not uh, disturbed too much by human activities, if we look at the biological communities, what we see are many, many native species, many of which rely on cooler cold water temperatures. Uh, many macroinvertebrate species <coughs> have very specific requirements for high oxygen in, in the water. And many fish species um, reproduce in a very narrow, a very specific season of the year. And oftentimes that reproductive period is synchronized with the natural flows. So they know when these flows are changing for their own benefit. Now, they'll lay their eggs in shallow gravel in the bottom of the stream. And for those eggs to survive, they need a relatively constant and predictable flow of water over them. So that's sort of what a natural system might look like. Now in a system where we have modified flows, and in this example, uh, lower than natural flows, or depleted flows, uh, one of the big things we notice is a, a, a major loss of native species. And those native species are often replaced by non-native species, or sometimes even invasive species, which have all kinds of other problems associated with them. And few of the species, or the species that survive also often thrive in warm water temperatures, um, uh, and also with low dissolved oxygen. They can get by without a lot of oxygen in the water. Interestingly, a lot of the fish that thrive in these systems reproduce any time of the year, and they do so by scattering their eggs just throughout the stream in hopes that some of them find a good place to live. It's really the life strategy of a dandelion, for lack of a better word. And then interestingly, the Algae communities don't always have a consistent response to flow modification. And one reason might be because their life cycles are more tightly synchronized with the chemistry of the water than they are with the flow, with the quantity of the water. Well, this little, this little example shows, a, a, I think, illustrates a couple of important points. One of them is uh, that these biological communities respond differently to this human caused uh, stressor, this flow modification. And the second thing we've learned from this is that streams that have modified flows are also especially vulnerable to additional human stressors that might change the water or air temperature, which we might expect under various scenarios of climate change. So that's the story on flow. Uh, I'd like to now talk about excess nutrients. Now, nutrients are applied as fertilizers to our lawns and crops and gardens, and some of which uh, enter our waterways. Um, as Bill mentioned, NOCLA did a national assessment of stream flow, I'm sorry, a national assessment of nutrients in streams and rivers. Um, and the main point from that report was that in agricultural and in urban settings, nutrient levels were many, many times higher than background levels. And background levels would be the nutrients we would expect in the absence of fertilizer applications to the landscape. So in this report, what we've done now is taken that information and linked it with the biological communities. And what we find is that algae communities are, are, are extremely uh, highly associated with nutrients in the stream. And in fact, what we see is that the occurrence of algae communities in poor condition, so remember, these are communities that have less than their natural potential or that are impacted. Uh, the occurrence of these communities increased nearly 40% as nutrient levels increased. This is a, a very broad analysis across all the different land uses and across the country as a whole. Now, algae grow by absorbing these nutrients directly out of the water column. So these organisms are very sensitive to changes in the chemistry of their environment, 
and they're therefore very good early warning indicators of the ecological consequences of excess nutrients in our waterways. Moving on to pesticides. Um, these compounds are also applied to our lawns and crops and gardens, some of which enter into our waterways. Uh, several years ago, NOCWA did a national assessment of pesticides in streams and groundwater. The main finding from that report was that uh, pesticides were detected in nearly every stream that we assessed that was in agricultural or urban watersheds. Nearly every stream. And even though those concentrations varied through time, like I showed you on, on the Des Moines River, um, many times those concentrations reach levels that are potentially harmful to aquatic life. So that was the finding from the previous report. And now what we've done is, again, bring it in with the biological data. And what we find is the macroinvertebrate communities are uh, highly associated with pesticide levels. Specifically, the occurrence of communities in poor condition uh, increased over 40% as pesticide levels increased. And again, this is across different land uses and across the country as a whole. <clears throat> now, the most potentially toxic pesticides that we found were insecticides, which of course are designed to kill insects. Well, macroinvertebrate communities and streams are, are uh, pretty much dominated by aquatic versions of insects. So this community is especially sensitive to insecticides that get into our waterways. Now, in recent years, the EPA has uh, stepped up some of the regulation of some of these insecticides that we observed, um, and especially in urban areas. And NACWA uh, monitoring has, uh, did confirm that those concentrations of pesticides declined in the environment after the EPA uh, took those actions. Now importantly, uh, when these uh, pesticides were taken off the market, they are re were replaced by other compounds, other pesticides, uh, that have different chemical properties. So it will be important for us to continue to monitor how those compounds and chemicals behave in the environment and potentially affect uh, ecosystems. So, I just told you about three uh, important factors that influence stream health across the country. A modification of natural flows, excess nutrients and pesticides. I want to emphasize that this does not mean that these factors are equally important everywhere, nor are these the only factors that impair stream health across the country. In fact, in any given stream, it's very likely that many factors are at play in, 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 in harming the stream health. And to get this point across, I want to tell you a story about a stream, uh, Shingle Creek, a watershed, it's in an urban watershed in Minnesota. Well, Shingle Creek uh, samples of the biological communities by NACWA and our partners all reveal that the aquatic communities were all in poor condition. In other words, all of these communities <coughs> were less than their potential. Well, at this point, re uh, uh, resource managers and scientists really have to become like detectives and figure out, okay, what, you know, where can we get information that provides evidence for or against alternative causes of this poor health? Well, a good place to look for clues is the biological communities themselves, because these critters are living in the water for weeks to years. And so they can really tell us a lot about the kinds of conditions they've been exposed to. So what do the communities in Shingle Creek tell us about what might be causing poor health in the stream? If we look at the algae communities, what we find is that, uh, the most abundant species are the ones who really like highly saline environments. Okay, well this is a freshwater stream, right? So uh, the implication there is that we have, may have a salinity problem. And in fact, when we look at the intensive monitoring data that took place with NACWA and, and our partners, what we found is very high levels of salinity in Shingle Creek during the winter. And this led to the conclusion that Road salts applied to de-ice the, st the, the streets and sidewalks and such were washing into the streams and groundwater. Well, it's tempting to stop here and say, aha, we've figured out what the problem is. Let's roll up our sleeves and see what we can do to fix it. Well, it's very important in this, in this process of diagnosing the causes of, of poor stream health that we examine all parts of the ecosystem. We can't ignore other biological communities. And so if we look at macroinvertebrates, what do they tell us about poor health in Shingle Creek? Well, what we see in, in, uh, in the macroinvertebrate communities is a lot of species that uh, have 
evolved in different ways to breathe outside of water. In other words, they don't need a whole lot of oxygen in the water to get by. So that tells us, well, we might have a problem with dissolved oxygen in the stream. And in fact, when we look at the intensive chemical monitoring that occurred in Shingle Creek, what we see is during the summer, many times, that dissolved oxygen dips below levels that are known to be harmful to aquatic life. Well, what do the fish tell us about what's wrong with Shingle Creek? Here is what we don't see that's striking. What we don't see in, in this community uh, is several species that have very specific habitat requirements. We know they should be there because we've looked at streams that are undisturbed in that area, and we know that these species ought to be in Shingle Creek, but they're not. Well, that suggests we may have a problem with, with habitat quality. Now, there is a, a USGS stream gauging station in Shingle Creek and that's been measuring stream flow. Um, every 15 minutes, uh, automated. There's not a person out there dipping water every 15 minutes. Measuring flow for over 10 years. And if we look at those data, what we see um, is there's been changes in the flow that are probably the cause of this habitat degradation. What we've seen is the stream flows become much more, um, much more fluctuating or flashy, which is pretty common in urban streams because the rainwater rushes off the, the roads and the pavement and into the stream channels, and those big pulses of water can cause erosion to the stream banks and the stream bottom, which, which harms the habitat. So to recap, the algae community, in, in harmony with the intensive monitoring data, revealed that we have a problem with salinity in the winter. The macroinvertebrate community, again, used with the intensive chemical monitoring data, revealed that we have a dissolved oxygen problem in the summer. And the fish community, along with the stream flow monitoring information, revealed that we have a problem with habitat that has occurred and is probably continuing to occur over the last several years. Now, this story in Sh Shingle Creek is not unique. We see this in agricultural and urban streams across the country. But it teaches us a very important lesson. And that is, um, if we're going to understand what is causing poor stream health, we really need to uh, assess multiple biological communities, not just one, but many. Um, and we need to measure the chemical and the physical parts of the ecosystem that can cause those communities harm at different times of year and at different time scales. So um, I'd like to close with just the, the take home messages I hope you guys remember. Um, the first is, um, in our attempts to understand stream health and to understand what harms stream health, it's vitally important that we uh, assess multiple biological communities because each community has its own vulnerabilities, unique vulnerabilities, to human-caused stressors. And I think I've shown you that throughout the talk today. Also, these communities have uh, different and vital parts of the ecosystem. You know, they're, they're, they have vital roles in the ecosystem itself. What that means is that when we do assessments, and when we limit those assessments to a single biological community, um, those assessments are important and they give us good information, but they're probably overlooking some factors that are causing poor health and probably underestimating the scope of the problem. Point number two, uh, again, a quick review. The stream flows, natural stream flows in the country streams are widely modified and are um, an important reason why a lot of streams have impaired health. Stream flow is such an overarching and important part of streams, however, that remediation of chemical pollutants like, like nutrients and pesticides may not get us all the way where we want to healthy streams if we don't also consider that these streams need some semblance of natural patterns of flow as well. Truly, water quality and water quantity are inexorably linked. And finally, in any given stream with its in poor stream health, there, it's very rare that we can point our finger at one thing. There's often many factors at play, and to understand those factors, we have to monitor them at the scales that matter to the biology, to the ecosystem. So we have to monitor these factors at the times of the year when they are important to the communities. Um, so the uh, the report for which this talk was given are in the, in the package you received. Uh, on this website, you can find 
uh, the data that went into this report. You can find, we're working on a really cool podcast. It'll be up in a couple of days. Um, and you can find also links to other reports that the NACLA program um, has, has put out in the last couple of years. So with that, I will stop. And thank you for your attention. Our second speaker today is uh, Mr. David McKinney. Uh, David is the uh, Chief of Environmental Services and Habitat Protection for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Uh, he's a former manager of the East Tennessee Office of the Division of Water Pollution Control for the Tennessee Department of Environment uh, and Conservation. Um, he holds a, a Master of Science in Aquatic Ecology from the University of Tennessee and a law degree from the Nashville School of Law. So with that, I'd like to introduce him. Thank you and, and good morning. We are here today to discuss how to bring good science to protection of the nation's aquatic resources. I'd like to tell you a little bit about why that is important to the state of Tennessee. We have some 60,000 miles of streams and rivers spread across the state. It's a network that provides for commercial navigation, for recreational activities, it provides water for agriculture and industry. We have a world-class sport fishery and importantly provides water, drinking water, and public water supply from one end of the state to the other. We withdraw something in the neighborhood of 10 billion gallons of water a day to support all of these uses. Um, but what makes Tennessee's aquatic ecological resources unique is that this 60,000 miles of streams and rivers are spread over such distinctly different ecological and physiographic regions. Starting in the east, you have the forested uh, Appalachian Mountains, which rise to, to 6,000 feet. You come across the Tennessee Ridge and Valley System, where the headwaters of the Tennessee River are gathered. Up over the Cumberland Plateau, which the Nature Conservancy refers to as a bio diversity hot spot for North American, and then down across the uh, interior low plateau or highland rim that surrounds the central basin. As you go up over the western highland rim, you come out into the alluvial plain of the Mississippi and coastal, and coastal plains. Um, this, this diversity of habitats and the diversity of streams and, and water sources has led what David Atnire, Professor Emeritus of Fisheries at the University of Tennessee refers to as a theater of uh, evolution for fish and aquatic life unlike any other. The challenges we face in Tennessee are similar to what other states are facing. They come from population growth, land use change that is attendant to them, and increasing pressure on water supply all with a backdrop of, of changing, uh, changing climate. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that all states are dealing with has to do with the influence and the hydrologic behavior of streams from water withdrawal. In 06, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in conjunction with other state and federal agencies and conservation organizations, began a project where they looked at the fish community records from over a thousand sites in Tennessee. Many of these sites had records that go back multiple years. This information was integrated with hydrologic behavior information, both historic and present, from over 300 sites. The results of this study confirm what the GS is finding nationwide that as you change the natural hydrologic behavior of streams, you can in adversely in impact the fish community and set up a situation where compounding factors like nutrients can have an additional adverse effect. In Tennessee, our normal low flow period is in the fall of the year, but if withdrawal of water stretches that low flow period well into the early summer and well into late fall, then the fish community, the aquatic community of insects are faced with the cumulative impact of reduced habitat, uh, 
higher water temperatures, lower dissolved oxygen, and the complicating impacts of things like, like nutrients. So how do we take this information and apply it to the decision-making process at the state level? In Tennessee recently completed um, two model regional water supply plans in conjunction with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Geological Survey, and some conservation organizations. Um, keep in mind that the communities affected in these two model plans, one for the north central part of the state, the other for the southern part of the Cumberland Plateau, these communities are located where they are because of reliable water supply. Many of them date back to the late 1700s, early 1800s. In the intervening years, these aquatic resources can no longer support the community. So the problems are twofold. One is the community no longer has a safe, reliable water supply. The other is, as you take more and more water out of the stream, it affects the ecological health of the stream. These two plans seek to tie together these communities through infrastructure that will allow them in times of low flow and even drought to withdraw from larger sources like the Tennessee River, the Cumberland River, or existing larger reservoirs. This brings us an opportunity to apply another tool that was developed by the USGS and the MACWA program, and that is that cluster of models that are referred to as sparrows particularly those that allow us to project the influence of nutrients on streams. As streams slow down in impounded situations, they heat up and are exposed to more sunlight, and nutrients can cause algal blooms which result in taste and odor problems for uh, public water supply, it can also result in toxicity problems for fish and aquatic life and on very rare occasions can result in problems with the public health. I want to close with some remarks about the biological diversity that, that is found in Tennessee. For freshwater ecological systems, it is the most biologically diverse stream system in North America. We have over 325 species of fish many of which are as colorful as anything you'll find in the tropics, and over 400 species of freshwater mussels. Keep in mind that these two are linked. The mussel requires a fish in its life cycle, and not just any fish, a specific species of fish. If that species disappears from the system, then in short order, the mussel fauna of that particular mussel group will also disappear. The state's name comes from a Native American word, Tenasqui, which the Spanish encountered in the 1500s and interpreted to mean something like river country. But more importantly, it embraced the benefits of living in river country. We have no illusion about how difficult it's going to be in the coming years to protect this diversity of aquatic resources. But good science, cooperative partnerships with our neighboring states, good partnership, collaborative projects with the federal agencies, conservation groups, and our citizens are our best chance of success. Um, thank, I want to thank the sponsors of this event, and particularly my colleagues that helped put all of this together. We'll be around to answer any questions you may have later. Thank you. Our final speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Peter Ode. Um, Peter is the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Water Pollution or Water, Water Control Laboratory. Um, he received his PhD in entomology from Cornell <coughs> University with a, with a specialization in stream um, insect ecology. Since 2005, uh, Peter has served as the lead scientist for the State Water Resources Control Board Bioassessment Program and he currently co-leads the state's technical team charged with uh, developing the technical foundation for California's statewide 
biological water quality standards. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dr. Rohde. Thank you, Bill. Well, good morning, everybody, and greetings from sunny California. I have to say that I thought um, Central Valley was hot, but you guys have a speed. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak in support of this really valuable work. I, my goal today is to give you a little sense of what the, these federal water resource programs mean in states like California. Um, let me see here. The, if you think about water resource monitoring in the country, much of the, much of the work that's done derives from authorities and mandates in the Clean Water Act. California has its own version of this uh, called the Porter Cologne Act, which was actually enacted a few years before the Clean Water Act and, and, and in fact served as a model for much of the language in the Clean Water Act. Um, both of these forms of legislation had a tremendous, uh, were tremendous successes in the uh, early years in dealing with point source pollution especially. And a lot of the initial problems have, were, were cleaned up. But as we've gone along in time, we've realized that much more difficult non-point sources have stymied progress in um, water resource management for decades now. Despite hundreds of billions of dollars now spent on these kinds of issues, our streams and our rivers are still in trouble. And in California, just to give you a sense, our, we estimate about 50% of our stream length is impaired biologically or ecologically, similar to what seen nationally. It's now widely accepted that if we're going to resolve some of these sources of problems, we need, um, we need to recognize that they're complex and they have multiple sources. And the solutions to them, we need to have a, a pretty complex understanding as well. And so this is one of the main roles that USGS and NACO in particular play in our, in our state. The contributions of these programs help us in a couple key ways. One is that most states can rarely afford to do the type of um, type of these complex environmental investigations on their own. They simply don't have the resources to support that type of work. And so we, the federal work supplements that. It's very important. The second, though, is that investigating problems at larger spatial scales gives states a perspective that they can't get on their own. So in this map here, the colored regions represent different ecoregions um, in the western United States. And just as the, the, the ecoregions go beyond California's borders, so too analyses or research that spans those, those borders that occur at larger scales give us a much better perspective on what's happening in our state, give us some com comparison to what's happening outside of that region. Now the next couple slides I have prepared just a short overview, give you the 30,000 foot view of California. The California has a very diverse uh, natural environment. It, is, it, is, it has continental scale diversity, we like to say. Um, we start with uh, temperate rainforest, redwoods in the northwest, um, snowy mountains through ringing much of the state. These are pretty wet areas, but much of the state, probably most of the state, is dry. Uh, we have a classic Mediterranean climate throughout the majority of the region. Mediterranean climates are characterized by having precipitation all fall within a few months, in, in our case in the winter and then it's dry for almost the rest of the year. And so most of these systems have a boom-bust cycle for water. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, deserts in the southeastern portion of the state. So quite a lot of natural diversity. Now, laid on top of this natural diversity is a complex, uh, complex land use pattern as well. So uh, these are the maps of the urban land use in California and the agricultural. But like most states, California has lots of different types of land uses, and of course streams are, are faced with uh, things uh, like dams and mines, uh, lots of other things. 
The two biggest, most dramatic ones are, I think echo what Darren presented in his presentations, agricultural and urban land uses are the dominant land form. Just to give you a flavor of what that looks like, Southern Coastal California, this is flying into Los Angeles Airport, um, LAX, uh, up to the mountains there, it is pretty much blanket, you know, cover to cover, carpet, carpet of concrete. You know, it's, these are dramatically transformed landscapes. The same is true in the agricultural regions. The Central Valley of the state is nearly completely transformed to um, produce uh, agriculture. It's irrigated ag. It's almost 100% irrigated ag. So the whole region in the center of the state um, is about 1% of the uh, agricultural land in the country, but it produces nearly 10% of the agricultural output. And that, that water that, that irrigates that is um, critical to doing that. So, you recall Darren started his presentation by talking about how the change in population in our country over time has, has resulted in the link to increasing pressures on our aquatic resources. Well, the same is certainly true in California. Um, California's population is now 38 million. Uh, we, that's one in eight people in the United States live in, in California, <coughs> which is a lot. Um, that's um, growing at a pretty steady clip. We're expecting another 20% increase in the next 15 or so years, and that will continue beyond that, probably. You notice in this map the darker colors represent more intense population growth projections. And you may recall from the map that these areas in dark blue correspond nicely with the really dry areas of the state, not the wet areas. And so what all this does, of course, all these slides taken together, is there's intense competition for water. And will be increasingly intense competition for water for, for domestic agricultural use and for environmental floods. Now, the source of all this water, there's several different sources, but one of the, the big ones, probably the most important, is, Cal is the snowpack. Remember we have the rains, most, and most of the precipitation falls in the winter. What we get in that period um, lands in the Sierra, that's the big, so the white areas in the map here are snowed areas, this typical year. Um, and that water melts over the summer and serves as the, as the water supply for most of the state. It supplies 25 million people with drinking water and um, industrial water and a million acres of agriculture are irrigated by that water. Give you a sense or flavor for how tenuous this is. This year, 2013, we have currently about 17% of normal snowpack. That's, um, that's very dry. And as a result of this, only 35% of the requests for water were able to be met by the state water agencies. So that's a, um, a pretty big impact. The, think about uh, projections for climate change going forward. The, what it's looking like is a, what, the, what we're experiencing now may be something like new normal. You know, 50 years from now, this may be an average water year, not a extreme low water year. So, so the, well, the upshot of this is that if we're going to make good decisions about how we manage our, our water resources and our our streams and, and uh, rivers, we need tools to help us prioritize protection and remediation. So we're approaching this in two ways. One is by making sure that we have the capacity to monitor ecological health. And so this, again, echoes the work that uh, the NACO program has done. We we want the capacity to directly monitor ecological condition. We do this with multiple indicators, benthic, al uh, benthic invertebrates, benthic algae, and also riparian uh, condition indicators is what we're emphasizing. The other big area that we're working on is uh, collaboration with EPA's Healthy Watersheds Initiative. The, the idea of the, oh, 
The idea here is to build a framework that will allow us to combine different types of information about watershed health and stream health um, together into a coherent picture. So just to give you a quick example of what that, what some of the output looks like. Here, darker colors in this map represent watersheds that are in a relatively better condition than, than the lighter colors. And you'll, um, the value of this is that it gives us an objective framework for making or asking management questions. So we can put all kinds of different data types into this and generate these types of maps and then generate um, and then put them together. And so by doing so, that allows us to ask questions like where are, where are our best streams? You know, where are our, our most vulnerable streams? And where are our, the best opportunities for protection and restoration? Now, if we want to do a good job of that, the quality of those outputs depends on the data that go into them. How good are the how good is our understanding of the relationships between stream health and the factors that we're, you know, the chemical, physical, biological factors that we're measuring? Because that's another place where the, the USGS NACWA work fits in. Is that so just to give you an example, um, the the NACWA programs work on Flow is, is really critical to us to understanding this. So, and this is of course an area where the USGS and Aqua have a long history of, of really important research. The, this has given us a sound understanding now of how to assess altered flow conditions. What we're doing in California is working with NACWA to help clarify the relationships between flow alteration and stream health, the ecological health of our stream. So that, that linkage is what we're working on. The kinds of questions we're asking with this work are, you know, what are the best kinds of indicators of, of hydrologic alteration? How much, uh, key one here is how much alteration can be tolerated by biological communities before you start to see impacts? And finally, what are the best indicators of environmental flow requirements? If we want to protect aquatic life, what should we be? What should we be making sure that we're looking at? And it's this ability to predict flow and flow alteration that we are getting from our partners in the USGS and NACWA are these are key to managing resources and these um, in, with these increasing pressures on uh, water. It gives us better information for resource prior, prioritization. This healthy watersheds concept. It gives us better ability to predict the impacts of climate change. And it's, I just want to end by making the point that it's, it's these federal contributions of expertise and the ability to integrate information across broad, regional, and uh, even national patterns that, you know, that greatly strengthen our ability to, to do this kind of work. So with that, I will say thank you and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Most of you, hopefully all of you, um, received copies of this folder when you when you walked into the document or when you walked into the room here. Um, there are two different versions of that that uh, folder. One includes a hard copy of the report, and another uh, has a thumb drive that contains the report on it, as well as uh, a fact sheet or a briefing sheet that kind of gives you a condensed version, as well as a small, you know, one page. Uh, summary of, of the salient points, major points from, from the document, as well as a, a document that we put together um, that looks forward on the, on the plans, long-term plans for the, for the National Water Quality Assessment Program. So hopefully if you haven't received one of those or you didn't pick one up and if there's any copies out there, um, please feel free to pick one up. If, you, if there aren't any available, please leave your business card uh, with your name on it. We'd be happy to send you one. Uh, our intention is uh, this afternoon or within the next day or so to get the presentations up online on our webpage. And within two weeks, there'll be a video of both this presentation as well as a, a video uh, presentation uh, that was made of this, um, of the findings from the ecological synthesis that, that Darren described. So hopefully there'll be multiple forums for people to get information. And of course, if there's something there that, that's missing, 
or that you still have questions, uh, uh, Dr. Carlisle, email address is, is available, of course, on our website. Please, please, uh, we would encourage and, and be very happy if, if you would call us and ask questions that, uh, you know, if, if you have.